Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Chen Yu and I'm from Intel. I have been working on the task wake up optimization for the past uh, few months. Um, and last year's LPC conference, there was a discussion on improving the idle scan if, uh, efficiency. Today, we are going to give some following up updates in this area. I would like to uh, seek suggestions on the next step. So here is a brief introduction of the problems. The first problem is the scan wastes uh, too much time searching for an idle CPU, especially when the system is overloaded. To mitigate this symptom, two approaches are proposed. The first one is the uh, sysutil, which limits the scan depth based on the system average utilization. And it has been merged recently, so I will not talk about this in detail, but um, besides, there is an ongoing effort to leverage the CPU, uh, idle CPU mask to speed up the search, uh, which is currently called uh, sys filter. Um, the second problem is what we encountered recently. We found the cross CPU wake up issue when running some workloads with frequent contest switch. Uh, I will talk about this cross CPU wake up issue in detail. And Abel will talk about the uh, sysfilter later. Um, so although the sysutil can improve scan efficiency, it cannot deal with the cross CPU wake up issue. We use real skill benchmark to reproduce this issue. One subtest of real skill will leverage the pipe read and pipe write to strengthen the scheduler. According to the result um, of the top command, which is marked as red, when, the, when this issue happens, the idle percentage is around 30%, even if the system is saturated by many tasks. The reason why we think the idle percentage is, of, is abnormal is that if we set the CPU affinity for these workloads, to stop them from migrating among CPUs, the idle percent, percentage dropped to nearly 0%, and the throughput increased by about 300%. According to the per profiling backtrace, the bottleneck is the run queue spin lock. It shows that the system wastes a lot of time spinning on the run queue lock. And shown by the per profile, task A is uh, in the first uh, backtrace wants to wake up task B on CPU one. Then task A grab the run queue lock of CPU one. If CPU one is about to quit idle, which is, uh, is shown in the second backtrace, it needs to grab its own lock, but it has been taken by someone else. Then the idle task uh, takes more time to quit and the waste of time on run queue lock hurts the performance. And during the recent uh, 6.0 merge window, the uh, weak list mechanism has been enhanced. If the weak key CPU is idle, then use the weak, weak list to offload the CPU activation to the idle CPU. This is accurate, actually done by sending IPI or sending pulling, uh, setting the uh, pulling flag to kick the idle CPU. The benefit is that the Cross run queue lock contention has disappeared. However, we still observe around 30% of idle duration. According to the second per uh, backtrace, the idle task spent quite some time on skill TDW pending, which is mark, uh, marked in the. This function is the core logic to enqueue the weak key when idle quits. But the side effect is that it would take more time for the idle task to quit. Here is a possible scenario to explain this problem. Since skill TDW pending, delay the quit of idle. In step two, the idle duration looks longer. Then in step three, 
this non-idle duration would mislead cis util. Uh, later, cis util suggests the weaker uh, scan for more CPUs. The time spent on searching for an idle CPU would make weak key waiting for more time, which in turn leads to more idle time. So this looks like a chain reaction, and the same thing has raised a question. Uh, is, if the system is busy, and if the weak workloads are doing frequent contest switch, is it still a good idea to spread the weak key on different CPUs? Um, so, and not just LPC, and also um, in Vincent uh, presentation, and uh, Vincent and Wick propose a direction. Can we consider the task running time during the wake up? So in our test case, the task is doing contest which frequently, it is regarded as a short running task. Then we propose an experimental patch in this direction to check if it helps. The idea is that if the system is busy and if the weaker and the weak key are both short running tasks, the weak key could be put on the weaker CPU safely. The reason is that if the weaker is a short running task, it might relinquish the CPU soon and the weak key has the chance to be scheduled. On the other hand, if the weak key is also a short running task, the impact it brings to the target CPU is small. So if the system is already busy, maybe we could, we could know the bot to find an idle CPU. The effect of this change is that the weak affinity is enhanced and the cross run queue wake up is reduced. Um, uh, by now, uh, we launched some micro benchmarks using kernel 6.0 RC4. According to the test result, with the patch apply, NetPerf, Hackbench, and Wheel Scale uh, benefit, benefit more NES. And there's no noticeable difference in T-Bench. The figure on the left is the NetPerf result. The Y-axis is a improvement percent. The X-axis is the number of dead per threads. So we found when the system gets saturated, the throughput increases by um, more than 100%. The reason why we did not see any improvement when the system is extremely busy, uh, might be that the SysUtil has already taken care of the overloaded scenario. So this benefit might come from two parts. One is the um, reducing of the uh, Cross CPU and um, wake up, and another is the cache locality. The figure on the right is the hack bench. We noticed some improvement when the system is saturated, and this result is aligned with real skill. Uh, the pipe uh, workloads benefit most. Um, by now, the experiment patch only has test data on throughput. Uh, we are also thinking of run other benchmark to see if there's any impact to the uh, tail latency. Um, but before that, I'm not sure if it is a great way to solve this uh, cross run queue wake up issue be by enhancing the weak affinity. And uh, it would be appreciated for any feedback on, on this. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, hi, Chen. Did, did you finish? Where should I give you the presenter? Okay. Hey, um, sorry, I had a question for the current presentation. Okay. Um, one thing you said is if the Wakey, sorry, the waker is a short running. You wanted to wake up the wakey in the same CPU, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. And 
I am not opposed to that, but I feel like this is a more of a generic issue that's not related to really how long the waker is running. It's more like how long between the time you wake up to when the waker goes back to sleep. That seems like a more of a generic problem that would be better to solve it in a gen more generic way than just focusing it on short running tasks. Put another way, we see the same issue on Android too, where a long running thread will wake up another thread and it's going mm -hmm. to go to sleep in another few microseconds. It would have been better to run the wake key on the same CPU, but it ends up getting scheduled elsewhere. So maybe like a generic solution for that would be better than focusing on the runtime of the waker. Um, the, the issue is more severe because when, when the task is a short running task, because that that um, indicate a more frequent context switch, and context switch will will um, cause the task wake. Right, the problem will be more severe when there are more frequent context switch. But if we if the task is a non running task, uh, the cross CPU wake up might be there's number of that. Right, That's my my thought. Yeah. But yeah, I, we can we can still consider. Uh, so besides the short running task, I think Vincent has also proposed that uh, we can consider the long task for a long running task. We should try our best to put it on a completed idle idle CPU or cores because it might indicate that it it requires more resource or something like. That. One quick point to kind of set some context. When I say long running, I'm talking 10 milliseconds is long running, just to make sure we're on the same page. We can move on. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Should I make available the presenter? Yeah, I think so. All right. So, Ten minutes warning. Yeah, and ten minutes warning. Hey, hi everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Wu Yun, and I'm working for ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok. Today, I will talk about my recent work on improving SRS scan efficiency. Okay. The three stand agenda, the background, what we need is a feature and the future, how it works and the benchmark, how much benefit it brings. Okay, let first see, check the background. SRS is the fast pass of selecting and run queue to place the CFS task. It plays an important role in maximizing the utilization of CPU resources. Mm. When selecting cache hot CPUs are given the most preference, and if they are busy, then a domain scan on target LC is fired, trying to locate an idle core or idle CPUs. And the SIS domain scan is the part where the filter targets at. Okay, currently, it scans in a linear fashion through the LLC domain. So the worst case cost is well bounded in small LLCs. So please see the figure below. Uh, if the LLC only has four CPUs, then the worst case cost is picking at the four CPUs starting more. It is acceptable, although it would be better if, uh, if there are some magic to tell us, try the last CPU first. Uh, no free launch right. Okay, as the LLCs become bigger, the line the linear scanner also plays well under light pressure. Uh, see the second, the first part of the second LLC. But once the load increases, more CPUs need to be scanned, so the scalability is questioned. And the schedule features SIS prop was born to limit the scan depth. Uh, recently, a nice work done by Chen called SRSUTIL has been merged into the mainline kernel to replace the SI prop. 
and it makes the scan depth proportional to the load of the target LC, which sounds more reasonable. Okay, with the limited scan, the cost of domain scan is well bounded, even in large LC. Yet it would still be better if, if more widely scan can be. Um, and this is what the SS filter born for. Together with SIS util to better fit the trends in the real world. Okay, nowadays lots of cloud service providers are trying to reduce TCO of their data centers by co-locating multiple workloads together to squeeze all kinds of resources. And in the meantime, the LCs are also getting bigger than before. With the filter, um, the bigger CPUs are skipped so the idle ones can be easily located as the figure below shows. Uh, although there are, might be some po false positives that we will talk about later, it uh, makes the scan much more efficient. Okay, let's, ch let's, let's check how the filter works. The filter is uh, is a CPU mask resident in the LLC shared scheduled domain. It contains, it is supposed to contain idle or scheduled idle CPUs along with some false positive CPUs. The CPUs are set into the filter when they become idle at core grain. Please see the figure below. The number indicate core numbers and the alphabet shows the SMT sibling. Uh, when CPU 2A, which is the first CPU of core 2, goes idle, it will be set in the filter. Because 2B is not set, so 2A, when 2A goes to idle, it is set to the filter. But if you uh, take CPU 3A, for example, uh, 3, 3A is already set in the filter, so the the propagation can be skipped, and then, uh, and we don't need we don't need to do the update. Well, well, the the tricky part is, uh, is the four four A. In the picture, the prop the propagation will also be skipped if its sibling is present in the filter. Uh, so this is why it's called core granular updating. It can reduce the LLC cache traffic. Uh, yeah, don't forget it is LLC shared CPU mask and can also bring benefit by awards that stacking the task on single core, uh, which may make the load more balanced. Well, the downside of core granular updating is that some idle CPUs can be missed due to their siblings are present. Well, it seems not a problem if the false positives can be corrected properly. Okay, and Jury, do you have any questions? Okay, let's. Yeah, we okay, have five minutes. Hmm. Oh, please, second. please. Uh, hi. So uh, there was a talk yesterday by Julia Laval on uh, the Nest uh, scheduling changes. Uh, you know, it's the research uh, paper she's written uh, where she talks about uh, something similar to this, where they are. Uh, building this nest of CPUs, which are constantly reused. And so she showed an interesting graph where, uh, you know, in the wake-up path, uh, when you're doing the scanning, it, uh, the, the wake-up path tends to pick CPUs linearly, like uh, one after the other. And so you end up waking up cold CPUs instead of like hot ones, um, possibly with cold L1 caches and stuff like that. So I was wondering if, uh, you know, one of the things I was thinking was uh, personally to explore whether 
some of the uh, changes she has made, uh, you know, can be uh, can be used to fix the wake up path, and uh, you know, uh, do a better job than than just like uh, constantly spreading tasks uh, on the wake up path. Uh, and it sounds like uh, this is a similar problem, but it's not the same thing. But you know, I just wanted to bring it up. Uh, do you see any? Uh, Yeah, yeah, I see Jure uh, has, has, uh, uh, has worked on this in 2020, I, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yes. I think so. So basically, yes, my, I, my point is that because she's uh, constraining the number of CPUs, it sounds like that will itself reduce the, num the amount of scanning, right? Like, because you, yeah. you're, you're building this nest of CPUs instead of, instead of having your search space the entire like LLC or whatever, uh, you know, you're restricting restricting it, which has which will also improve the scanning speed, right? Yes, um, yes, it is. Yes, yes. So I feel like the problems overlap, and yeah, do uh, you think so as well? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So something to think about. Uh, Mel? Yeah. Mel? I, I, I think the two ideas of the, the nested versus idle search are related, but not necessarily the same thing. Uh, because while searching within a nested CPU, you're looking for uh, a CPU that is uh, idle, uh, but recently idle, whereas this presentation is more about finding idle CPUs of any type, but would be related. If, if, there, if there was like a nesting mask, it would make sense to try and find an idle CPU within the nest first. And then if one is not available, which is perfectly possible, use the um, idle mask in uh, this presentation to find an idle CPU regardless of cold state, like whether it's in a, a deep sea state or cash cold or whatever else. So I, I think the ideas can complement each other. I don't think they contradict each other. Okay. One minute. Uh, okay. Please. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, whether it's been considered to organize this as a tree. So basically, I think it's kind of the, the weight. Uh, so so each, each CPU has a usage, and then based on its idleness, I mean, some might be less used than others. So if they are organized by uh, uh, ordered uh, within the tree, and then you get, let's say, the most idle CPU at the bottom of the tree, then you could even use uh, do uh, nearby lookups to do, oh, okay, what is the nearest to me that is idle, or what is the most idle in the system, and that should limit the, the, the scan to something quite limited. Yeah, the tree would be expensive to maintain, but, it, the, but the idea still has merit because the CPU mass could be, uh, could be uh, done in multiple paths, uh, passes. So the first pass would be within the nest, the second pass would be an idle CPU, and the third pass would be the entire domain. With the search depth limited by whatever sysutil tells you uh, Mel, is the allowed depth. Mel, we're yeah. gonna have to, uh, we ran out of time, so we're gonna have to cut okay. it off. You guys wanna meet together at a hack room, pick one of the hack rooms uh, in the BBB server, and you could continue the conversation. Okay. Like Thank you. Thank you.